The New Testament lesson for today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Listen now to the word of the Lord. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them to his vineyard. When he went back out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again at noon, and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go to the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit indwell each of us, that the words I speak would be your words, and the message we hear is the message you desire us to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> if I start to nod off, Yell fire or something. Well, probably not fire. That wouldn't be a good thing. So come up and hit me or something. We'll work something out. If you are anything like me, you could read this parable multiple times and come up with a slightly different angle each time you read it, depending on the word or phrase you used to summarize the story. Three things in particular jumped out at me as I read and reread and reread this parable. First, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard is focused on the 10th commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. In a very real sense, this parable is about coveting. While covet may not seem the most obvious word to describe what's going on here, it does fit both the emphasis of Jesus' teaching and the overarching emphasis in Matthew on the law and Jesus' representation of it. It does so in a way that transforms our thinking. We covet what God chooses to give to others. A parable is essentially an elaborate allegory we are invited to see ourselves in the story and then apply it to ourselves. The wages at stake in this parable are not actually daily wages for vineyard workers, but forgiveness, life, and salvation. We need not literally be laborers in a vineyard as we are all co-workers in the kingdom of God. In any relationship, friend to friend, husband and wife, one believer to another, covetousness 
is a problem. The point here isn't necessarily that other folks receive blessings from God that we don't, that they get more or better or lovelier gifts from God. The problem is that they get the same as us, and they just don't deserve it, do they? They are less worthy or later arrivals or just plain worse sinners. They don't deserve the same we get, do they? Not nothing, maybe, but certainly not the same. The parable's day laborers parallel perfectly with today's forgiven sinners. We have a tendency, as the, ter as the parable aptly illustrates, to covet and to be resentful of what others receive from God. The owner of the vineyard asked those who have worked longest and hardest for him, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? The point is that God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness are God's to give away as God sees fit. As a direct result of this, we covet God's power to forgive and God's control over who is forgiven and how. This parable is perfectly matched with the story of Jonah who has run away to avoid, being, to avoid delivering the message of forgiveness that God has sent him to proclaim. Jonah complains, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. Surely this cannot be for them. It is ironic that Jonah, who had earlier declared that deliverance belongs to the Lord, a deliverance he himself experienced, has rejected the good news of who God is for others. The parable of the laborers in the vineyard is about coveting, about our frustration with the grace of God as it applies not to us, but to others. Second, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard is about the first and the last. The parable itself displays a reversal of expectations. The last will be first, and the first will be last. This is not only the summary of the parable, but a critical aspect of New Testament theology. Notice the flow of the narrative as the workers are compensated for their labors. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. When the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. The landowner who represents God decided to pay all the workers the same providing an act of mercy, not injustice. God's grace and mercy are given abundantly upon those of his choosing. For he says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not depend on man's desire or effort, but solely on God's mercy. The first group of workers in the vineyard represented rece resented receiving the same wage as the last group. Their attitude was similar to that of the Pharisees, who were incensed at Jesus' teaching that others could inherit a heavenly kingdom they thought was reserved for themselves alone. They despised Jesus for offering the kingdom to poor, oppressed, weak sinners whom he made equal to them. God's goodness and mercy produced envy and jealousy in the self-righteous Pharisees. 
the rest of the workers received the wages without complaint or envy of others. In the same way, as Christians, we should rejoice when others come to the Savior, as we should rejoice in the service others render to him. He is faithful to reward us for our service as he has promised, and how he rewards others should be of no consequence to us, nor should it affect our devotion to him. Whether God calls someone early or late in life to partake of his grace, the glory and praise for our salvation is his, and his alone. It in no way amounts to unfairness. Just as the landowner has a right to do what he wishes with his own money, so does God have the right to have mercy on whom he will have mercy. The last are literally first in that they are paid first, and the first who have labored longest must also wait the longest to get their pay. But notice as well that the first who are now last do not receive nothing or less, they receive the same. As the laborers themselves say, you have made them equal to us. This element of the parable is taken up in the other Gospels. This reversal of expectation of our sense of justice and even of our hopes is a central piece of the New Testament. Whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all. So much for human ideas of greatness. Jesus, who is first and last, tells us that we need not fear. For him, the first and the last are brought together when we are called to lay down our burdens and find our home with God. The message of the parable is that we are all equal recipients of God's gifts. The scandal of our faith is that we are often covetous and jealous when God's gifts of forgiveness and life are given to others in equal measure. Third, the value system of God is different from the value system of the world. The negotiation of a contract is part of the value system of the world. The first workers employed in the parable chose this system to relate to the landowner. The value system of the world has a pay structure that increases with increased working hours. Workers who work longer hours are paid more than those who are who work less hours. It also demands that those who have spent a longer time in employment are considered first and given preference when increases in wage and bonus are due. God does not treat us according to our works, but according to his compassion and mercy. According to their works, the people of Nineveh deserved to be destroyed. God, however, in mercy sent Jonah to call them to repentance. Jonah hated the people of Nineveh so much that he ran in the opposite direction to avoid preaching to them. When he finally came to Nineveh, the whole city repented and was saved. Jonah, instead of being happy at what had happened, was so grieved that he was ready to die. He felt that the people of Nineveh did not deserve to be saved, although he himself was a recipient of the grace, mercy, and love of God. God does not want any of us to perish, and through repentance and belief in Christ, we have access to his presence. Let us turn to Christ today and enjoy this abundant provision. In contrast to to the Ninevites, who Jonah regarded as a waste of time, if Nineveh was to be overturned, why not now? Jonah had allowed anger to push love out of his soul. When the Lord first asked the question, Jonah was angry because the hated Ninevites were repenting and the Lord was forgiving them. The Lord contrasted this selfish concern with the Lord's concern for people, even wicked people. 
Here was a great city filled with people deprived by their leaders of essential skills of learning. They had never received instruction in moral principles and holy practices of dealing with each other. They had a multitude of children who had no hope of hearing the truth about the living God unless a Hebrew taught them. They had wealth enough to possess many cattle, but they did not have true riches, the true knowledge of God. The moral and spiritual poverty of Nineveh deeply concerned the Lord, and here he had a prophet on his hands who was excited about preaching judgment but was blind to the opportunities the revival in Nineveh provided to instruct and nurture the people on how to live a holy life before him. The value system of God is based on love. God does not love us because of who we are and what we have done, but because of who he is. God is love. This value system is by grace because Christ has fully paid the price for sin. We are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. The workers who did not work the full time knew perfectly well that they had received a gift they did not deserve. The reason the men who worked 12 hours in the vineyard were so upset was they were only concerned about themselves. They resented the generosity of God because it was not extended to them. Those who accepted the value system of God were spared the value system of the world. In the world's value system, wages are determined by productivity, working hours, and seniority. In God's value system, relationship replaces work, and his generous provisions replaces wages as seen in today's parable. The landowner was more concerned about a relationship with the laborers than about the work. On his first trip to the marketplace, the laborers he employed were more interested in their reward, as demonstrated by the fact that they first negotiated their wages. To them, it was just another day at work, a job, and a paycheck. They missed the landowner's interest in a relationship. On his subsequent visits, however, at 9, noon, 3, and finally at 5, these workers realized the value of a relationship with the landowner. They saw no need to negotiate a wage. God's values, God values each one of us and offers us to work in his kingdom because he wants a relationship with us. Let us accept his gracious offer and enjoy his presence. In summary, there are three points we should remember. First, we should not covet or be frustrated with the grace of God as it applies to others. Instead, we should rejoice in God's grace to all. We are all equal recipients of God's gifts. Instead of being envious others of others, we should share the bounty of God's grace. And third, God wants a relationship with us. We don't get up in the morning, go to work for God, earn a little grace, and then ignore him as soon as we walk out the door. Relationships are so much more meaningful than work. So what do we do with all of this? What are we to take away from this message? First and foremost, we should be eternally grateful for the grace and mercy given freely by God to us, his children. We have done nothing to merit this grace and mercy other than accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. God, out of his overwhelming generosity, has given us this gift so we can be in an eternal relationship with him. I try to imagine what spending eternity with God and all the saints would be like, but my mind is simply not capable of comprehending the glory, the majesty, the peace, and serenity of heaven. Is this eternal generosity from God really a gift that we can simply receive and enjoy? 
Is there more to the story? Is there something expected of us for receiving this gift? The answer to these questions is yes and no. While God's generous gift is given with no strings attached, God does have expectations. God expects us to share the good news of this gift with others so that they too can receive God's generosity. God expects us to be generous with our talents, to use those talents in the service of others and for his glory. If you like to sing, then sing for God. If cooking is your thing, then cook for God. No matter what your talent or gift, put it to work for God. God expects us to remain steadfast in our belief. To not envy those who have more. To not begrudge new believers who receive the same gift that God gave to us. We should treat all we come in contact with as God has treated us. If a visitor comes to our church, it should not matter how they are dressed or how they act. They are God's children, just as we are. And we should be joyful that they are with us. Grace is God's gift to us as he chooses and when he chooses. God expects us to be generous with our finances. Everything we have is his, and we should be gracious and generous in sharing a portion of what, we, of what he has given us to take care of the needy, to heal the sick, to maintain the wonderful campus we worship in and that so many people in our community benefit from. I don't pretend to know the financial situation of anyone in this congregation other than my own, but if you're anything like me, there are things we throw money at that we do not need. And that could be put to better use if given to God instead. And before I stop yapping, I have one short little story. A young, ambitious man was talking to his grandfather about his future plans. The young man said, I will learn my trade. And the grandfather asked, and then? The young man said, I will set up a business. The grandfather asked, and then? And the boy said, then I will make my fortune. And the grandfather repeated, and then? The boy said, well, I suppose I'll retire and live on all my money. The old man asked, and then? The boy said hesitantly, well, I suppose someday I will die. And the grandfather looked the young man straight in the eye and asked, and then? And the boy had no response. My friends, aren't we like this young man? We make great plans for this life and ruin our health working to attain them. But we do not look beyond this life to our everlasting destination. I believe if we did, then absolutely every church would be filled to overflowing on Sundays. If we can let go of the rules of this world and concentrate on the life everlasting, we will see a shift in our priorities. Focus on God and eternal life with him and be generous with the gifts God has given you and you will be twice blessed with God's grace and generosity.